stories of J.G. Ballard. Tonight, News from the Sun, adapted by Brian Wade, starring Michael Ball, Jordy Johnson, and Diane D'Aquila. In the evenings, as Franklin rested on the veranda, he would often remember Triffitt and the last drive he had taken into the desert with the dying astronaut and his daughter. What do you think, Triffitt? Does it remind you of anything? Of course, I'm only going by the photographs I've seen since I've never been there, unlike you. What was that like, being the last man to walk on the moon? Stop it, Dr. Franklin. Stop what? You know my father will never answer you. That doesn't mean we should stop talking to him. All the other doctors think his situation is hopeless. They say it's only a question of time. Of course they do, because they believe there's no way to stop the fumes. But I think there has to be a way. All we have to do is find it. Right, Trippett? Franklin looks at the old man with his childlike body. Trippett's blanched eyes are open behind his glasses. But his mind is set to some private time. Ursula holds his shoulders as he sways towards the windshield like a stuffed toy. Uh, Trippett reminds Franklin of his own accelerating fugues. For a year, they have lasted little more than a few minutes each day. But in the past few weeks, they have lengthened to more than 30 minutes at a stretch. In three months, he will be housebound. In six, he'll be awake for only an hour each day. Can't you go any faster, Doctor? I'm going 40 miles an hour. Well, it feels like we're crawling. It's twice the legal limit. Don't give me that. I've seen you drive before. You're always speeding. That's true. Especially at dusk. So, let's go. It makes me feel like I'm alone on a forgotten planet. Like I can keep driving forever. Of course, I have to be careful. Franklin points at the wrecks of cars that litter the desert. Their drivers died of exposure before they could wake from their fugues. Look out! What? Damn it. That was close. Didn't you see her? I guess I was distracted by the wrecks. And... Is she okay? She's standing right in the middle of the highway like a mannequin or something. She'll snap out of it in an hour. Oh, let's hope so. What are you doing? I need to rest, Ursula. I think I'm more tired than your father. Franklin walks towards a bank of steel mirrors laid out in a semicircle. The solar farm had been put there to provide electricity for the concrete domes of Solari II, a solar city glimmering in the distance. A section of the collector dish lies on the ground. And Franklin can see images of himself. The sleeves of his white jacket stretching like the wings of a deformed bird. Ursula, bring your father. I am. What's the doctor looking at, hmm? Why don't we go find out? He'll be able to see himself suspended in space. We may be slow, but we always get there. We're upside down in an inverted image, just like your last flight. What do you think of that, Trippet? Do you see me waving at you, Dad? In fact, we're all upside down. What's that? It looks like Slade's plane. <laughs> Dad, come back here! I'll get him. Franklin runs after the old man, tottering among the mirrors, his clenched fists pummeling the air. The old astronaut shakes like an unstuffed scarecrow. One hand pointing at the mirrors. <laughs> Reflected in the metal panes are multiple images of the black aircraft. Like hundreds of vultures. Get down! Oh, are you all right? Damn him! Come on, Dad. It's okay to get up now. Just go on. Not exactly. What do you mean? Look, he's landing on the service road. What's he up to now? I'm going to find out. What the hell are you doing here? Doctor, careful of the wing. What? Take your hand off it or you'll tear the fabric. Right. I hope you aren't allowed to operate on your patients these days. What do you mean? Your hands, they're shaking up a storm. Franklin stares at his hands, 
which are trembling, and then looks at Slade, who is naked, except for the aviator's goggles tied around his white hair. Who else have you grounded lately? No one, and I didn't ground you. <laughs> Doctor, you practically closed down the entire space program single-handed. Don't talk nonsense, Slade. But I'm not worried, because I've started my very own space program. Really? Still bothering the old man? I'm just taking him for a drive. The speed seems to do him good. You know, you can always visit me at the clinic if the fugues get to be too much for you. I don't have them anymore, Dr. Franklin. What? I found a way of dealing with them. Well, you mean all this flying around? All you did was frighten Trippet. <laughs> you know, there is a way out, Doctor. A way out of time. How? So, you're interested. Of course I am, Slade. I haven't much time left. I know. And that's why Marion and I are going to help you. Marion? What's my wife got to do with all this? Slade? Come back here! While Franklin walks back to the car, Slade's plane heads for the gleaming hotels of Las Vegas. Trippett sits calmly in the front seat of the car. What did Slade want? Do you know him? Everybody does. Sometimes he works on our computer at Solari or he starts a fight. It's a bit crazy. He was a trainee astronaut once. That's right. I remember him saying that if it hadn't been for you, he would have gone to the moon. Well, I was chairman of the medical board that rejected his application, but... What? The real trouble is that we went to the moon in the first place. What do you mean? Well... The astronauts that went on the year-long flights were the first. Like my father. Exactly. And we all watched them go. We went there with them. So lately, I've been wondering if this time plague is because we broke some unwritten rule. What kind of rule? Well, perhaps we committed some kind of evolutionary crime when we left our planet and headed out into space. You mean we're being punished with the fugues? Possibly. But how could you ever prove any of this? All right, now it's just a theory. Come on, let's go back to the clinic. As they move along the highway, Franklin realizes he'll have to be careful. Slade's fugues should have become longer by now. Yet somehow, he's keeping them at bay. All that violent energy in his skull will one day push apart... Dr. Franklin, listen! What? Trippet is sitting up and alertly peering out the window. He takes hold of Ursula's hand. Yes, it's green here, more like Texas than Nevada. Peaceful, too. Plenty of cool trees, fields, and lakes. I'd like to stop and sleep for a while. We'll come out and swim tomorrow. Would you like that, dear? Oh. Trippet squeezes Ursula's hand with affection. But before he can speak again, a door closes within his face, and he's gone. Later, Franklin sits at his desk in the dismantled laboratory. The old astronaut's brief emergence into the world of time gives him hope. Is it possible that the fugues can be reversed? Mm. He thinks about going back to the darkened ward and taking Trippet for another drive. Could it have any connection with the appearance of Slade in his plane? Yeah. And how has Slade managed to elude the fugues? When Franklin saw him last at the clinic, Slade was already suffering from fugues that lasted an hour or more. Hi. Marion, what are you doing here? I thought I'd drop by for a visit. But you never come to the clinic. I know, but I thought I'd surprise you. How's your day been? Interesting. I took Trippett and his daughter for a drive out in the desert. What for? He was there. He was where? Trippett was completely himself for something like 30 seconds. Really? Yes. Somehow I have to convince the director to keep the clinic open a little longer. <sighs> I feel I have a chance now. I want to go back to the beginning and think everything through again. Why? Maybe the fugues are a preparation for something. And we've been wrong to fear them. 
I mean, when one out of a hundred people has the symptoms, it's virtually an epidemic. But they're closing the clinic this month. And out here in Nevada, there's probably another five out of a hundred people who aren't aware they've even been affected. Oh, they'll never let you stay and work by yourself. We definitely know that the topography plays a part in the feud. Uh, Robert. There's some kind of connection between the desert and... Robert! What? I think you should call it a day. Are you serious? I brought my camera. It's only the middle of the afternoon. I like it when I can feel the sun on my body. Mary. Come on. I want you to take close-ups of me. Real close. Close-ups. Take a look at this. Franklin pulls out the center drawer from his desk and offers it to Mary. This looks like some of Slade's work. It's the last shrine he built when he was a patient here. Why are you showing it to me? It's the blueprint of our joint space program. What are you talking about? Slade said that he and you were going to help me. I'll talk to you. Don't you want to help me? While Franklin stares at the contents of the drawer, he takes off his wristwatch and massages the raw skin on his forearm. Lying on surgical cotton in the drawer are a piece of lunar rock stolen from the NASA Museum in Houston, a photograph taken with a zoom lens of Marion in a hotel bathroom, her white body almost merging into the tiles of the shower stall, a faded reproduction of Dali's persistence of memory with its soft watches and expiring embryo, and a donor card bequeathing Franklin's brain. Franklin returns the hand of the stopwatch to zero. He has made a habit to do this every 15 minutes. That way, after the onset of a fugue, he has a reasonably exact record of its duration. He looks at the last pages of his diary. June 19th. Fugues from 8.30 to 9.11 a.m., 11.45 11.45 a.m. to 12.27 p.m. 5.15 to 6.08 p.m. 11.30 p.m. to 12.14 a.m. Total time, three hours. June 20th, three hours, 14 minutes. June 21st, three hours, 46 minutes. This gives him little more than 10 weeks, unless the fugues begin to slow down or unless he finds the trap door through which Trippett briefly poked his head. It's not until dusk, when Franklin is driving through Las Vegas, that he realizes his usual afternoon fugue has still not occurred. He likes the abandoned gambling resort. The other doctors live close to the clinic, but Franklin stays at a motel in the city. In the evenings, He often drives down the silent strip below the facades of the vast hotels. Or he wanders for hours through the drained swimming pools. The city, which once boasted it contained no clocks, now seems to be in a fugue itself. Hello? Can you hear me? Franklin looks at a middle-aged man in a shabby tuxedo who stands in a parking lot staring vacantly at a dead neon sign. He looks like a retired croupier. I'm going to take you inside or you'll freeze to death. Save your energy, Franklin. Slade. He's dreaming of the big roulette wheel in the sky. What are you doing? What does it look like? A hundred yards down the street, Slade sits in his plane, his white skin gleaming in the twilight. He gestures at a woman dressed in a fur coat to join him in his cockpit. Leave her alone. Your wife wants to learn how to fly. Marion. Come on, get in. Where are we going? We have to get out of here. (laughs) Damn it. Marion. Don't get in the... Couldn't you see him, Robert? Of course I saw him. Oh, he flew straight at you. I know. I'm still picking sand out of my hair. But you stood there, totally mesmerized. 
I know Slade's always fascinated you, but I think that was carrying it too far. It was a small experiment. Some experiment. If that propeller had been one foot lower... I wanted to see what he was trying to do. He was trying to kill you! Franklin sits on the end of the bed, staring at the cigarette burns in the carpet. He thinks of the rotating blade that had devoured the darkness. He can still see the propeller's silver lassoes spiraling out into the night as the plane disappeared among the hotels. His fugue had begun after he tripped and had lasted almost an hour. Marion is pretending the fugue had not occurred, but when Franklin came to, his skin was ice cold. What had she and Slade been doing during that lost time? Franklin imagines them together in Marion's car or even in the cockpit of the airplane in front of his sightless eyes. What are you thinking? Nothing. Through the open door, Franklin stares at his wife's naked body in the white, cube-like bathroom. A wet cigarette smolders in the soap dish. There are clusters of small bruises on her thighs and hips. Are you going to be all right? Yes. Because I'm finding it difficult enough to cope with myself. Don't worry. It wasn't an attack. Good. She sits at the dressing table and powders her shoulders. For months, they have pretended that neither of them is affected by the fugues. I'd like you to see more of Slade. What? Arrange a meeting. He was naked, you know. She turns and looks at her husband. Her left contact lens trapped under her eyelid. That's part of his code. What do you mean? Slade's trying to tell me something. He needs me in a special way. <laughs> Believe me, he doesn't need you. If it hadn't been for you, he would have gone to the moon. You took that away from him. And I can give it back to him. How? But we really need you to help us. Franklin waits for her reply. But Marion sits raptly in front of the mirror. Fingers retracing her upper and lower eyelids around the trapped lens. He places his hands on her shoulders, feeling the familiar, clammy skin of the fugue. He removes the contact lens from her eyeball, careful not to cut the cornea. Sitting beside her, Franklin holds her breasts in his palms. For a moment, Shoring up their slipping curvatures. Craters, palm trees, and sunglass. Yes, that's what I mean. Palm trees. If I put on the palm trees, then the sun will be my friend. July 11th. A dangerous fugue today, and what may have been another attempt in my life by Slade. I set off for the clinic, but I went only a mile before going off the road. I came to in the parking lot of an abandoned shopping center, surrounded by a crowd of staring faces. In fact, they were mannequins. Suddenly, there was a volley of gunshots. Fiberglass arms and heads were flying everywhere. Total time lost, eight hours, 17 minutes. The craters blink like eyes. The desert is a woman without mascara. She stares and stares until no one cares about our affair. July 24th. Must get out of the motel more often. A curious byproduct of the fugues is that I'm losing all sense of urgency. Sat here for the last three days, calmly watching time run through my fingers. I'm convinced that the fugues are a good thing. A sign that some great biological step forward is about to take place. Perhaps our sense of time is a primitive mental structure that we inherited from prehistoric man. For him, the invention of time was a way of classifying and storing the huge flood of events which his dawning mind had opened for him. Because now it's possible to imagine that everything is happening at once. That all the dark sunglasses... Dark sunglasses. No. I mean the past and the future are simultaneous. They bring news from the sun. <laughs> Total time lost. Twelve hours, fifteen minutes. August 21st. Slade has been here. I suspect that he's been entering the apartment while I fugue. When I came out of one, there was a curious afterimage, a vague biomorphic blur that hung in the air like a photograph. 
My gun has been stolen. And there's a small diagram of white paint on the back of my left hand. This afternoon, someone painted the same pattern on the swimming pool floor and the palm trees. Propel me. They sprout like green propellers, shading me from the glasses of the sun. Blink, blink. The pen snaps in Franklin's hand. When he wakes, he finds himself slumped across his diary. Torn pages lie on the carpet around his feet. Books have been scattered. His shoulders are bruised, as if someone had seized him while he was in the fugue, trying to shake him into life. It's not until Franklin goes out on the balcony that he realizes his watch has been torn off his wrist. He looks up and sees Marion wearing a ragged fur coat, sitting behind Slade, arms around his waist. She stares down at Franklin like a startled dreamer. Come in, doctor. What are you doing here? I'm waiting for you. What took you so long to get here? I had to stop every mile or so and then wait until I'd come to and I'd find myself sitting in the car. The temperature dial was my clock. You mean you missed this? My watch. Come on, doctor. We're beyond all that now, aren't we? But it's the only way I can tell how long I've been. Sorry. Think of yourself as a man without time. Please, let me have it. What do you think of your laboratory now? I've turned it into my mission control center. Slade. Look at all these photographs of Marion and me. Is she here? Don't you recognize her? Where is she? Right here. In each of these prints. That's not her. These are aerial photographs of the desert taken after some earthquake. See where the gun is pointing? That's my gun. And if I trace the barrel along this gully of Marion's body, it leads to only one conclusion. Stop pointing at her. So you do recognize her. I, I don't know. This gallery is my shrine to Marion. Instead of using her like you have for the last ten years. I didn't use her. Yes, you did. You've been pilfering parts from your wife and NASA in the same way. Leave me alone. Stealing parts for your space machine. Go to hell. Sorry, doctor. I plan to go somewhere else. I'm going to fly right into the sun. Franklin wakes up to find himself lying upside down in the overturned car, his legs sticking out through the broken windshield. He moves his arms and legs carefully. Nothing seems to be broken. Then he climbs out of the car. I left the clinic and started back to Las Vegas. And then, everywhere I looked, there I am, slaveens fondling each other, hills hooning like breasts. Within seconds, I was driving 40 miles an hour, and now it must be... I've been out of it for over two hours. That must be Las Vegas over there, at least 10 miles away. The white domes of Solari, too, seem closer. What's that? Those metallic silver mirrors. If I can get to them, maybe I can signal. Franklin sets off along the causeway between the irrigation ditches. After only a hundred yards, he sinks to his knees. The sand is liquefying at his feet, sucking at his shoes. Franklin finds himself leaning against a rusted pump head. In the sky above, a vulture circles. Go on. Get off my shoulder. You're not getting my eyes to nibble on. Okay. Let's keep going. If I can make it to the mirrors. Up somewhere. Move. palm tree over there. Sprout it up out of the sand like a green parasol. So what? Keep Go moving. On. Move. Take another step. That's it. Go now on. Now take Move. another one. Wait. Now there's two, three, four, palm tree. five palm trees and a slice of blue water. Come on, legs. Go on. Move. Move. Blue has become a lake. My arms are too heavy. If only I could get these damn sunglasses off my head. Look. A valley. 
green, green valley with a forest of palm trees and lakes. If only I'm moving, moving, keep moving. The sun is everywhere. There must be three, no, eight, eleven, twelve sun. But how? Twelve sun. Go on, move your arm. Yes. Shadows, shadows. Shadows. Everywhere I turn, the shadows multiply. Wait. There's a woman. Young and green. She's walking through the slice of the water. She's waving at me. Coming. Please, legs. Move my arms and wrap me in the coolness of your water. Blue. And I will drink forever with these twelve. Ursula, why is your father waving his arms? Conducting. Trippett's conducting? But to what? There's nothing but stones and creosote down there in the square. Amazon. What? Jungle. Ah, thank you for saving me. Already did you. What? Yesterday. Sweat much. Shout much. When I was delirious. Cry cry. But when I was out in the desert and I was in the fugue... Here, come. What? Oh, let me explain. When I was in the fugue, I saw. I was truly aware. Touch. Do you understand what that means? I saw what your father saw the day he went to the solar mirrors. Palm trees, lakes, and a green valley. Hand to give. You want my hand? <laughs> okay. <laughs> What are you putting it there for? Touch deep. Yes. Mirror. Mirror. What? My soul eye. Wait a second. Your skin is clammy. Bring you. And yet you can talk and walk around. News from the sun. Like it was nothing. You will know it. Tell me. What do you see? She smiles. Franklin knows better than to disturb her. From the veranda, he can look out at the evening and see the swallows darting among the domes of Soleri too. He will rest and learn the language of these birds. He takes off his wristwatch and tosses it over the railing. He is happy now to be free of time and looks forward to the moment when he too can embrace the news from the sun. News from the Sun by J.G. Ballard Dramatized by Brian Wade Starring Michael Ball as Franklin Diane D'Aquila as Marion Johnson as Slade, Patricia Van Stone as Ursula, and Angela Fusco as the narrator, with Jack Mather as Trippett. Casting consultant was Beth Russell, with original music by Timothy Clark. The series script editor is Sandra Rabinovich, recording engineer Glenn McLaughlin, with sound effects by Kathy Perry. Production assistant, Evelyn Chow. News from the Sun was produced and directed at Studio G in Toronto by series executive producer William Lane. Next week, having a wonderful time.